Welcome to lesson nine of the EVOC course. In this course, we're going to talk about some special uh, considerations. I'm sorry, this lesson, we're going to talk about some special considerations and safety issues that we have to deal with on the ambulance. We know that as the operator of the ambulance, you're responsible for everybody in it, and that includes the passenger and the crew, <clears throat> unless you're res responsible for the uh, vehicle itself and how you drive it and operate it and move it through the streets and in relationship to all the other vehicles and obstacles out there. Everybody that rides in the ambulance is supposed to be seat belted in. Um, the way I do this when I'm the paramedic is I try to get my EMT to hop in the back with me and together we assess the patient, put them on the monitor, IVs, meds, whatever needs to be done, but try to do everything we can on scene. <clears throat> and then we, and then I can go ahead and seat belt myself in uh, and hopefully ride to the whole hospital, the whole way to the hospital seat belted in. Once in a while, I'll have to get up and, and check on something or move something to get a piece of equipment. But for the most part, I can stay seatbelted in. My partner then gets outside, walks around the ambulance briefly to make sure all the doors are closed. Sometimes we get a piece of equipment out of one of the cabinets so we forget to shut the door properly. And it's really bad to spill everything down the highway. So he makes sure everything's secure on the outside. And I make sure everything is secured on the inside because I sure wouldn't want a monitor or some other piece of equipment falling out of a cabinet or up of a shelf. And smacking my patient upside the head. Not good. Now, as far as other passengers, um, their behavior, uh, they may have a, uh, I don't want to say equipment, but they may have things that they bring like a, a purse or a suitcase or a walker or something, and that has to be secured. Uh, but then they have to also be secured. So they're going to be seat belted in. And if they start to behave unruly or unsafe, then we're going to have to um, tell them to stop, give them some guidelines on what's acceptable and not acceptable and if they continue we'll have to stop the ambulance and we may even have to go ahead and, and call for law enforcement especially if it's the patient or family that becomes unruly or start trying to fight with us we'll have to get out and get away safely when we're transporting families um, <clears throat> or family members we'll talk about some times that we should and shouldn't perhaps um, we do want to make sure that they're safe we want to let them know um, what's happening try to keep them as a informed as we can about the patient's condition and communicating information with them. Uh, but again, make sure that everything is safe. So that typically means that they're going to be riding up front and they're seat belted in. Now you can decide whether you want to take a family member with you or not. It's your ambulance. You do not have to take them. We do it as kind of a courtesy and almost all the time we do. Uh, but just realize it's your decision. If you have kind of a funny feeling about it, don't think you should take them, then don't. That's your decision. Sometimes that we recommend that we do take them. If for some reason somebody is greatly upset and having the family member there helps them and keeps them calm, then that might be a good time to take them, uh, take the family member with you. Obviously, if you have a child, you want to have a parent with you for consent issues. <clears throat> I don't like this third point and the last point. The family is too upset to drive or family has no other means of transportation. And the only reason I don't like that, I mean, I think those are legit reasons, but I, you need to stress with them, communicate with them, that we're kind of a one-way trip. So when we take them to the hospital and we drop them off, we don't come back to pick them up and take them home. Um, that's what taxis and Uber and Lyfts are for. Uh, if there's a translator, that might be one of the few times I kind of have somebody in back. If it's the parent of a child, then I'll typically we'll have them in the back. Um, now, if it's a child of the parent, so imagine like you have a five-year-old who saw his dad have a seizure, called 911, Dad's still seizing when we get there, so he's the patient. You obviously can't leave the five-year-old alone, so you have to transport them with you. And front or back, that kind of depends on how the kid's doing. Uh, but they do have to be in a child safety seat of some sort, either a car seat or a booster seat. Now, everybody, as I said earlier, has to be seatbelted in, so passengers have to be seatbelted in. Remember that the average adult, according to EVOC, is 175 pounds, so factor that in. Of course, look at your patient and decide, or your passengers, and decide if they're more or less than 175, but try to factor that in when you're considering the payload of the ambulance, because we don't want to exceed that. <coughs> Now, if they're not riding with you, um, we need to talk to them. It uh, surprised me when I first started doing this how many people did not know how to get to the hospital, but it's actually a pretty rare thing for most people to go to the hospital, much less go to the emergency department, 
nowhere to park, nowhere to go in for the emergency department. So you're going to have to give them some directions. You also want to let them know where you're going. And sometimes it's not a bad idea to have a cell phone number in case something changes. Maybe the patient's condition changes and we need to go to a different facility, um, then we can call them. Also let them know that no matter what type of mode you're in, emergency or non-emergency, they are not an emergency vehicle. I don't care how many hazard lights they have going. They have to obey traffic laws. They have to obey speed limits. They are not allowed to proceed through red lights. And do not tailgate. Let them know that that is a safety issue, and it's only going to slow things down and make it worse for their family member that's in the ambulance. So switching gears a little bit, let's talk about some potential safety uh, issues on scenes. I'm Hazmat. Took this picture outside of Chattanooga. Was hoping we could uh, kind of get away in case this thing wrecked. Uh, you can look at the placard, which is right there. And you can see that four-digit number, and from that you can figure out the 3191, what the chemical is, and then how far away you need to be if something bad happens. So where do we typically see these? Um, tractor trailers, compressed gases, trains, factories where they manufacture things because that's where a lot of chemicals end up. Uh, and you can look for those placards and the labeling. The driver of the truck should also have shipping papers with safety data sheets and what's what they're transporting. Um, <clears throat> I want you to, to realize, though, that your, your patient could have just uh, run to Lowe's or Walmart or Home Depot or someplace like that and picked up some chemicals for the pool, a little bit of fertilizer to fertilize the yard that weekend, uh, some paint for the house, and a few other things. And if this is on the trunk and they get rear-ended, you could have a hazmat scene right then and there. Um, also, things like uh, carbon monoxide, so if you have several family members in a house that are maybe having headaches and feeling tired and sick to their stomach, or even like a meth lab. So we can have hazmat scenes in lots of uh, different places. If you suspect hazmat, what you want to do is back up, get out of there. You want to be parked uphill and upwind from the scene. And then we kind of set up a perimeter where we keep everybody back and away from it. And then notify dispatch of hazmat and look at the hazmat team there. We oftentimes respond with fire departments. And we do this for pretty much every structure fire. Uh, there might be somebody that was burned or trapped inside that we can take care of, or more likely we're there to help the fire department in case one of them get hurt. So we're already there and we're ready. Um, you want to look for the chief with the white helmet or the incident commander and coordinate with them, find out where to park, what they want you to do. Most of the time we just kind of sit off to the side and we help the firefighters when they come out of the house and they're changing out air packs. We check the vital signs, let them cool off, maybe get them something to drink. Um, one of the things I do want to mention is never, ever, 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 ever drive over fire hose. There are two firefighters at the end of that hose that are dependent on that water. And if you drive across the hose, you can rupture the hose, pop the hose, water doesn't go to the nozzle anymore, and the firefighters can be severely burned or die. So never drive across the fire hose. <clears throat> Crowds, I always... Um, Think about this when I'm up in New York visiting my sister and seeing things like this ambulance and this fire truck trying to get through this crowd. Um, now, being that this is New York, everybody just ignores it. But most of the time when you have a crowd around an incident, when they see you, they see you as help. So maybe there was a, a bad car wreck or maybe there was a shooting and you show up and they see the lights and see the uniform and they know you are help. So they all come running to you. And that can be a problem. They can mob the ambulance. They can be um, trying to get you out and get you to go take care of somebody, uh, and that can be a bit of a problem. Or the crowd itself can become a little unruly and threatening. And I've had that a couple of times where the crowd has changed its tune and decided we were not who they wanted there and started punching us and kicking us, and we had to, had to get out of there. So it's best to have law enforcement help you when you have crowds like this to try to control it. But realize that there's a lot of people, and they can overwhelm fire departments, I mean, fire departments, police departments too, and you need to be able to uh, retreat. Now, if you're going to a violent act, like a, a, some sort of an assault, um, you definitely want to have law enforcement there. <clears throat> we typically think of this with domestics or suicides, the um, great unknown emergency. We don't know what we're going to. Always should have law enforcement. Diabetics, people that are on uh, medications like uh, drug overdoses, we definitely want to have law enforcement go first. And we are going to stage out of the line of sight because we don't want the potential bad guy on the scene to be able to see us, because if they can see us, they can shoot us. 
So we stayed far enough back, we stage out of the line of sight, and we let law enforcement go in, handle it, they'll clear the scene, make sure it's as safe as it can be for us, then radio to us, or radio dispatch and dispatch will radio us, that is clear to go in. They say we don't carry weapons, and that's true, and that we don't carry firearms. That's a topic for a whole other lecture one day, uh, whether we should or not. Um, we do carry things like clipboards and flashlights that we could use as an improvised weapon, but in general, we don't carry weapons. Now, many services are going to carrying body armor, so you'll wear some sort of a ballistic vest, and that's good. Um, <clears throat> it's definitely better than nothing, but um, if you suspect a violent act, it's really best to let the professionals, law enforcement, handle that. Now, down power lines, this is one that can be kind of dangerous because if you look at these lines, they don't look like there's anything wrong with them. You don't see them sparking or arcing. Uh, but these may still be energized, and the only way to really know is to go up and touch them, which if you touch them, then you die. So that would be bad. Hopefully, you can contact dispatch and contact utilities, and they can get things turned off. But I don't know if things are really turned off until... I guess I see the linemen come and mess with them and do something with them. And if they determine that they're dead, then I could feel comfortable going up there. But I'm going to stay back. And again, kind of like Hazmat, I'm going to keep everybody back and away from it. Now, as far as placing the vehicle, this is a bit of an art. Uh, we need to consider safety first and foremost. We need to consider how easy it is to get to our equipment and how easy it is to get to the patient. A lot of times on um, car wrecks, we'll park the ambulance in such a way that it protects the scene. So if someone's not paying attention, they'll hit the ambulance instead of us. And that kind of goes hand in hand with traffic flow. We also need to think about how easy it is to leave the scene. So a lot of times for residential stuff or homes, we will back up the driveway. That way the back of the ambulance is close to the front door so we don't have to carry them too far. And then we're allowed, uh, we'll have a much easier departure after we get the patient loaded in the back of the ambulance. Now, if it's not in a house, if it's some other open scene, obviously we'd like to be close so we don't have to carry the patient very far, but you don't want to be too close. We have carbon monoxide and fumes and things coming from the exhaust that's making the patient feel worse. So let's look at a few of these. I particularly like this one. Um, here is your ambulance. So if you had a car flowing or driving this way, it would hit your ambulance before it hits you if you were working on the patients in there. And traffic flow is pretty good. It's designed to go around the scene. So I kind of like this. Fairly easy um, access to the patient. Um, there's a couple of <coughs> excuse me, a couple of things that are problem, problematic with this. One is while you're loading the patient, you're kind of exposed. And the other one is going to be leaving the scene or departing. You have to kind of get <coughs> out into traffic. This next one um, I don't like as much, mainly because um, traffic flow. If a car is traveling along this lane, they could run right into the wreck um, and then go ahead and hit you and kill you because your ambulance is parked right here. <clears throat> now you have very easy access to your patient You're right there. It's not bad to load them into the back. Traffic flow is okay. Um, and you have very good or very easy departure. So there's some good things about this, but overall this would not be how I would do it. Now this one I do like. Um, this is a police car. I would like it better if it was a fire truck because fire trucks have a lot of water and water is heavy and they're big so they can protect the scene better. But with this you have traffic flow that's going around the wreck scene. You have the police car that's open protecting the scene. You are nice and close. You have very good access to your patient and patient loading and getting equipment and when you leave it's really easy. So if you can have a fire truck protect the scene, then you can park pretty much wherever you want, and you're pretty safe and easy to leave. This one's one of my least favorites overall, because here you are, and here traffic is flowing. Um, <clears throat> so you have traffic flowing, you have to dodge between cars as you go to and from the patient. Your ambulance is still exposed and could get hit by somebody traveling down the road. And it looks almost like the hazardous chemicals are flowing this direction towards the ambulance. And you definitely don't want that. And this one, the biggest problem is the um, down power lines. And they're kind of energized. They don't know um, exactly how long they are because if you measure the distance between those, uh, because of the weight of the wires and physics and all that, it's not the same as distance pull A 
to pole B. It's actually longer than that. So we want to be back at least two uh, telephone poles back. So if I had another pole over here, then I would probably be safe putting my ambulance somewhere on this side of things. Make sure you call the utility department and get them to turn everything off. Flares, um, <clears throat> we use these to try to guide cars around the scene. We don't use flares as much because they're fire and fire and wrecks. It's a possibility of gasoline leaks, fumes, that's bad. Um, so we don't use these a lot. But if you do use them, you're going to start about 300 feet back. And you're going to place one at 300 feet, 150, 100, and then kind of in front of it there. And the idea is that cars will then hopefully flow around the wreck scene. Better than flares nowadays are these reflective triangles. Um, these are much safer than flares. And we kind of set them up the same way at 300, 150, 100, and then kind of even with the front of the ambulance. And again, we hope that people will flow around the scene. I hope that answers any questions about Chapter 9 or Lesson 9. If you have any, please message me in Moodle. And good luck with your final lesson, Lesson 10.